You don't have to be Jewish or pro-Israel to be anti-Hamas, but someone forgot to tell that to student activist groups in colleges and universities across the United States as they are actively, grossly, and transparently blaming Israel for the terror attacks carried out by Hamas against Israel. Here is a long list of those organizations, 31 to be exact, at Harvard alone. But it's not just Harvard. Student groups across the nation are advocating for this anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, pro-Hamas garbage. Pretty much pick a Palestinian society on a college campus, and they've put out a statement referring to terrorists as martyrs and or blaming Israel. Some even go so far as to stamp their statements with paraglider graphics, alluding to the Hamas terrorists who flew into Israel by a paraglider to slaughter, brutalize, and terrorize innocent Israelis. And right on brand, BLM Grassroots as well as BLM Chicago, well, they've put out similar images. Not only are these people and these groups just wholly grotesque in nature and on the wrong side of history, they're also fully confused morons. Same with these Queers for Palestine activists. Who wants to tell these people what would happen to them in Palestine or really any other Muslim fundamentalist society? You know, the ignorance is truly astounding, even by typical liberal standards. These campus and activist groups that coddle and make no apologies for radical Islamic terrorism are also known to simultaneously accuse conservatives of being anti-gay because we don't want gay porn in schools. Have they not read Islamic doctrine? If you think conservatives are homophobic for objecting to gay porn teachings in schools, wait till they hear how the religion of peace handles it. And speaking of double standards and overall social justice warrior idiocy, as someone who has been violently chased off a college campus, I just find it super rich that these blatantly pro-Hamas, pro-terrorist student organizations are allowed to form and assemble under the guise of free speech when conservative speakers like myself and countless others are told we are unwelcome on campuses due to our hate speech. Even more ironic when you consider speakers like myself and Riley Gaines are labeled as hateful for speaking out against the trans takeover of women's sports. Newsflash morons, they don't allow trans people to exist in these Muslim fundamentalist countries, let alone swim against women. If these brats think we the taxpayers are going to foot the bill for their student loan forgiveness when this is the way they operate and these are the things they protect, well, they've got another thing coming. On September 11th, the Biden administration gifted Iran, the world's foremost state sponsor of terror, with $6 billion. Almost exactly one month later, Iran finances Hamas's brutal attack on Israel. Now the White House has maintained that that $6 billion wasn't used by Iran to fund this Hamas attack on Israel and maintains that Iran hasn't accessed that funding yet. Well, then here's a wild idea. Rescind the freaking money. But does Biden regret giving money to Iran? Look, we've said since the beginning that Iran is complicit in this attack in a broad sense because they have provided the lion's share of the funding for the military wing of Hamas. They have provided training. They have provided capabilities. They have provided support. And they have had engagement and contact with Hamas over years and years. And all of that has played a role in contributing to what we have seen. Does the administration regret making the prisoner swap with Iran in light of these attacks? The United States does not regret bringing home American citizens who have been unjustly detained abroad. As I said before, the president has no higher priority than to get Americans home. But speaking of money, did you know that since 1950, U.S. taxpayers have sent over $6.3 billion through the United Nations to subsidize Palestinian refugees living in Gaza, the West Bank, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon? That was until President Donald Trump cut the Palestinian aid to zero in 2018. Of course, Biden resumed the funding in April of 2021, and wouldn't you know it, just weeks later, rockets were again aimed at Israel. And now, here we are. Joining me now to help us follow the money is Open the Book CEO and founder, Adam Angievsky. So great to see you. Such an important conversation. You know, when we booked you on this show last week, we just wanted to talk about all the money being spent on furniture. But now we've got a whole nother dimension to all this. So I really want to dig into this Palestine aid and uh, what your what your revelations on that are for the people who are really curious as to how much money we've sent and what that money has been used for. 
So the U.S. taxpayer, through their generosity, Tommy, has been funding Palestinian aid for over 71 years until 2018 when Donald Trump cut it to zero. He said, hey, very reasonably, I'm not going to give them subsidy. I'm not going to give them aid if they're not going to come to the table and negotiate a peace deal. He thought that they were not serious about peace, so he cut their aid. That had not been tried in the 71-year-old 71 history, 71 history to that point of Palestinian aid. So, yeah, again, and I'm, he took a lot of flack for that. Of course, we know that Joe Biden, as I mentioned, and as you have studied, uh, he obviously resumed that aid. So how has that impacted everything that we're seeing now? I mean, can we be sure that that aid hasn't been used for terrorism against Israel? I'm sure not. Well, we can't be sure. Let's use the State Department's quote from just a couple of years ago. Anthony Blinken was asked about this, and Blinken said, that no, he said, uh, look, we do our best. We work through our partners. We work through the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the United Nations, and even through the nation of Egypt to try to get the aid to the people who have real needs. He says, but we can't be sure. We can't guarantee it. That's a de facto admission that we, that we, that, uh, we just don't know if our U.S. taxpayer dollars was used by Hamas to restock their weaponry. Look, Tommy, uh, Joe Biden, when he restarted the aid, the, the Palestinian aid in 2001, he started it in April. Since then, we've poured in over $1 billion through the UN into Palestinian aid, and we can't even guarantee its effectiveness. Yeah, and then there's also the discussion, especially this week, about that $6 billion that the Biden administration gifted to Iran on September 11th, which they swear up and down was not used to attack Israel, whether it was that six billion or they were counting on that six billion so they could use other money to attack Israel through Hamas. Uh, it all adds up to the same thing. When you are aiding and abetting terrorism, uh, you have to be honest about that. I don't think a lot of Americans, although with the scenes in the streets lately, I would hope Americans would not be for that. But let's also talk about some of the gear, the U.S. military gear. Last time we talked to you about this, it's even more important now. How much U.S. military gear was supplied to Afghanistan in a 20-year period? So it was $82.9 billion of U.S. military gear and training supplied to the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Security Forces. So if you break that number down, it was 600,000 weapons, and that includes 350,000 M4 and M16 rifles, 65,000 machine guns. You got 25,000 grenade launchers. Look, everyone is saying that the Taliban, they're not a sophisticated army. They're not a sophisticated soldier, but they know how to use and monetize that kind of weaponry. We turned the Taliban into a major U.S. arms dealer for the next decade, and they've been selling tickets to their terrorist gun show for the last two years. To the extent that these rifles, this weaponry, are now in the hands of the Hamas, you know, Biden needs to be further held accountable for his hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan. And then we've got Ukraine we can throw into the mix as well. I mean, it's almost impossible to trace where Hamas and terrorists have gotten th their weaponry. But I think it's safe to say that a lot of it is probably uh, from the United States of America, either directly or indirectly, given we are seem to be incompetent with our bookkeeping and our housekeeping when it comes to Afghanistan, when it comes to Ukraine. I mean, name a country we've supplied things to. It usually ends up being used against us. So that's a concern of, of a lot of the American people is that we are indirectly directly funding terrorists, and it might not be over. What can you tell us about, you know, future, um, I guess, future allowances that we're making to terrorists and what that spending looks like? So every single dollar of U.S. foreign aid, for instance, that goes to subsidize, uh, goes to subsidize Palestinian aid needs to be on the table immediately with the Biden administration. Uh, you've got the PLO. They have a history of providing the gruesome policy of public pensions for uh, their, their martyrs, their terrorists. They provide those pensions to their families. It, the Wall Street Journal called this practice pay for slay. It's a gruesome practice, and it's one reason Trump was right to cut funding to the aid to, to the Palestinian refugees. 
And there's just so much more waste uh, to go around in, in our government. And this is a shocking total that Open the Books was so great to put out there. It stunned a lot of people, as it should. $3.3 billion spent on furniture when people were mostly working from home. What can you tell us about that? Absolutely, Tommy. I mean, if you think government spends your money better than you do, <laughs> this just proves the case, right? During the pandemic years, when there was an order to, you know, work from home, the telework policy, public uh, federal employees were paid to stay home, and their agencies loaded up a billion dollars a year, three point three billion dollars during the three pandemic years of 2020, 2021, and 2022 on furniture. You got the State Department paying a quarter million dollars for solar powered picnic tables. I, I, I'm sorry, that was the CDC, Centers for Disease Control. You got the State Department, they pay $120,000 for expensive brand new Ethan Allen leather recliners for their embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan. That's wild. And meanwhile, Americans are struggling. You know, Obviously, the news has shifted so much, but just last week we were talking about a government shutdown and what that would look like and not being able to fund the government. What's your initial thoughts on that? Would that have been such a, a bad thing if the government shut down for a while? And, and how much spending needs to be reined in so we aren't constantly getting these headlines from Open the Books about our money being spent poorly on furniture and leather recliners? You know, Mark Twain probably said it best, Tommy. He said that when the legislature is in session, my life, liberty, and property are not safe. Typically, I don't have a problem with Congress uh, not being in session, that's for sure. Uh, right now, we've got real problems in the world, and we gotta get a 2024 federal budget passed, and, and there needs to be limits and hard caps. And right now, the Democrats want no spending limits and no caps. And far too often, Republicans join Democrats to drain the U.S. Treasury from the left. Republicans need to get serious. And I got a great example of this on earmarks. These are pork barrel spending projects requested by, by members of Congress to bring pork back to their districts. And Republicans have gone hog wild in the House, in the, in the spending bills being debated here this fall. Republicans represent the top 63 largest earmarkers in the House. You don't even hit a Democrat to the 64th one. And in the Senate, eight out of the top 10 earmarkers are Republicans. So Republicans, they need to get serious. They need to, you know, get back to being true fiscal conservatives and stop talking out of both sides of their mouth. Yeah, that's really frustrating. A lot of Republicans go to Washington, D.C. talking about cutting spending, and then it gets away from them. Just imagine how that works and all this money being spent. Meanwhile, the American people are being taxed to death. We're paying for it through inflation at the grocery store or paying for it at the gas pump. And Americans should be furious about this. In all of your investigations that open the books, is there one single area? I know there are many, but is there one single area where you see the most waste by the federal government? Yeah, I mean, we we put the whole concept and database of the third party paid royalties to the scientists and leaders and agency over at the National Institutes of Health on the table a couple of years ago. And we're seeing real movement in the opening of that database. I mean, during the pandemic, Tommy, you and I and the American people started to feel that big government was very close to big pharma. That database shows just how close they are with all the different conflicts of interest. So we're going to see a lot of breaking stories from our team at OpenTheBooks.com on that database and all the insider trading and conflicts of interest that are in that database as we expose all of the connections. Oh, I can't wait for that one. Uh, I promise this is my last question for you, but you brought something up that I think is really important. You know, I, I've seen a lot of discussion on, on Twitter, of course, on social media. Of course, um, Americans want to stand with Israel, back Israel. We've also still propping up Ukraine. But there's a lot of discussion as to our members of Congress and, and how much involvement the United States is going to have. And speaking of conflicts of interest, is Open the Books digging into at all which members of Congress, which representatives are due to make a lot of money if, in fact, the military-industrial complex really revs up again? Have you studied that? And what should the American people be paying attention to? Yeah, I think, you know, we have to follow the money. And one of the things that we do very well at OpenTheBooks.com is we take different data sets and we mash them up and those audits make national news. I mean, that's a great idea to see, 
you know, the defense industry, who are they funding? Which members of Congress, which U.S. senators, and then what kind of legislation and what bills and what votes and what policies are those members advocating to the American people? I, we haven't done that report, but that's certainly a great idea, Tommy. Oh, please do. Uh, we would love to see it. I think it's so important. I remember during COVID wondering which of our representatives were making money off of COVID. And so I think we definitely, as we're edging closer to U.S. involvement, maybe boots on the ground at some point. We really need to know who's benefiting from uh, the blood of the American people. That's concerning. I also want to thank you before I let you go. Uh, I recently did commentary on Open the Books' investigation into gender spectrum. That was yeah. uh, fantastic reporting by you. Uh, opened my eyes to it, and we really dug in there. So thank you so much for everything that you guys do at Open the Books. And here, here's the follow-up to that story. That nonprofit actually wrapped up business. They sent out an email to their sub email subscribers saying that they're done. This was a nonprofit funded by a California state grant through the Newsom administration, Governor Gavin Newsom, that basically was teaching kids in schools to invent their own gender. Thank you, Tommy, for covering that story. It was important. Thank you so much for all the investigations that you've done on it. You know, small wins along the way uh, turn into big victories. So thank you, guys. And we'll talk to you very soon to talk about more government waste, because I'm sure it's not ending anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy.